Okay, so welcome everybody to day three of our four day honors showcase, um, where our 19 honors graduates will be uh, telling you about their awesome capstone projects. Thank you all so much for coming today and for your various kinds of support for our honors students. Um, just a few housekeeping notes here. Um, we will have three presenters today who will be talking for about 10 minutes-ish each. And uh, once that all three of our presenters are done uh, with their presentations, we will open it up to comments and uh, questions from our audience. So if you will, um, you can use the chat, you can raise your hand later and we'll, we'll, we will get to those. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording this session and it will be made available at a later date. We believe it will be up on the Honor Showcase page. That's our plan right now. And possibly in the Honors Program archives. <clears throat> um, there are a few students who could not present live this week and uh, their presentations are already up on the Honor Showcase page if you'd like to take a look at a few more at your leisure. Okay, so I think we are ready to go. And uh, first, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Maggie Hudson. Uh, hi, Maggie, welcome. And uh, Maggie has a PowerPoint video for us with her voice already recorded on it. So Lisa is gonna play that and then um, we will have a chance to talk to Maggie in person later. So uh, Lisa, take it away and everyone sit back and enjoy. Hi, my name is Maggie Hudson, and today we'll be looking at human resources support of working parents. And our focus question is, how can human resources better support working parents? Next slide, please. Human resources is a contemporary umbrella term used to describe the management and development of employees in an organization. Also called personnel or talent management, Human resources involves overseeing all things related to managing an organization's human capital. Human resources, therefore, focuses on a number of major areas, including recruiting and staffing, compensation and benefits, training and learning, labor and employee relations, and organization development. Next slide, please. While most parents desire to have one parent work in full time while the other stays home to raise their children, financially, that is a tough task. However, there are many advantages to both parents working. This includes less financial stress, better health care, higher quality daycare, more nights out as a family, and even more frequent vacations. However, it is no surprise that the rising cost in America has been rising at a fast pace. Take, for instance, a report from CNN, where in 2018, the price index, which tracks American spending habits, showed a significant price increase in items that were being purchased. When prices speed up, paychecks don't go as far. Average hourly earnings only increased 2.7% over the year in June, which means that most workers' paychecks aren't going any further at all. In 2019, both parents and 64.2% of American families with children under 18 were employed. With the data collected, we can see the importance of both parents working to continue to meet the basic demands of their children and beyond. Next slide, please. Now we will be looking at the skills human resources seeks when hiring. Every business entity has a set of skills that they have adopted as they must need a skills in order for their company to succeed. These skills for the most part are all the same. According to Indeed.com, there are a few skills that employers look for in job candidates, no matter what the open position is, and having these skills can make you more marketable to recruiters. The skills are on the screen. According to, job, uh, to Jacob Share, a job search expert, he agrees with Indeed's list of soft skills in the article he published on LiveCareer.com, where he states, degrees and credentials are important. 
but the development of soft skills is a crucial part of fostering a dynamic workforce. You may have soft skills that are in high demand and not even know it. Skills that can be added to your resume and help you become a better contender in your job search. If you're a parent, you are most likely one of those individuals jo Jacob is referencing. Now, we will look at the skills used at home by parents. While you may not have thought about it this way, parenting can be similar to managing employees in the workplace. Both are about leadership and both are built on high quality relationships. As a mother to six children, I would say that becoming a parent means that to succeed, you must master some very important skills. These set of skills may be your tools to succeed as a parent. According to an article found on skillroads.com, many transferable skills that parents learn, such as time management, conflict resolution, and event organization are all in high demand by employers. It is no surprise that you will find a wide range of articles written about all the skills you can transfer from parent to the workplace. Next slide, please. For more than a decade, I have served as my six children's friend, mother, teacher, and overall caretaker. I have mastered nurturing my children, learning how to negotiate different aspects of our lives, multitasking on a consecutive basis, and I can even say with confidence that I have mastered problem solving, leading to the overall success of our family. When my husband leaves for military duty or even to report to the fire station, I am left behind to manage the entire household on my own. My daily tasks include, but are not limited to, managing multiple meetings in a day, cooking, laundry, settling down any conflicts between my children, and learning how to problem solve any other issues that may arise. Also, while serving as a mom, I had the pleasure to work in a few multi-billion dollar industries where in one of these companies, I had the pleasure to lead a team of up to 65 people. A few years ago, I worked as a case manager at a billion dollar company. My duties involved providing a one-stop resolution call to all incoming calls. That meant I was the salesperson, the retention person, the accounting person, and the expert in water filtration system. In essence, pretty much the expert in providing a one-stop perfect outcome and knowledge to every scenario possible. Within my role, I had to be great at critical thinking. For instance, I needed to know and respond quickly in a professional manner to comforting the wife who tragically lost her husband and can no longer afford water service. I needed to be excellent at communicating with my peers, customers, clients, vendors, and local partners in order to ensure the success of all parties involved. Being adaptable meant that instead of not wanting to be promoted out of fear of not being with my peers, who I was already comfortable with, it meant that I instead embraced adaptability. I attribute my success in these companies to the skills that I develop and strengthen through my parenting role. If asked if I believe that these skills I utilize daily helped in my success as a leader, the answer will be without a doubt. Next slide, please. Skills used at home as a parent and skills used at the workplace both show similar skills to one another. We're able to see through multiple articles that highlight the various skills that both scenarios utilize for success. The survey that was launched to help see if the information obtained through multiple sources correlated with the sources or not clearly show that the parents do, in fact, have used these skills in their journeys as parents. Without a doubt, there is a clear consensus within this research that draws a clear parallel between the two. Next slide, please. A competitive advantage is an attribute that enables a company to outperform its competitors. 
This allows a company to achieve superior margins compared to its competition and generates value for the company and its shareholders. A company who is thriving and shows no sign of slowing down is Patagonia. Patagonia is an American clothing company that markets and sells outdoor clothing and is well ahead of many companies by understanding and acknowledging the competitive advantage of hiring parents. Since the start of Patagonia over 35 years ago, there has been a 95% retention rate of parents. So what else is Patagonia doing to retain some of its most valuable employees? Aside from having on-site childcare, they also have 16 weeks of paid maternity leave. Men get 12 weeks. As if that's not enough, Patagonia also pays for a caretaker to accompany parents on business trips. I don't know about you guys, but I was mind blown by this fact. Now, Dean Carter, a head of HR for over 20 years at Patagonia, says that providing childcare has impacted employee experience and outcomes in HR. Carter has noticed the impact of providing childcare and school car turnover engagement, and gender equality for women. According to uh, Forbes, in 2019, Patagonia brought in an estimated $800 million in revenue. As you can see, Patagonia has figured out how to maintain a reputation of one of the leading environmentally friendly companies while still taking care of parents in the workplace. In essence, Hiring parents provides a company with a wide range of advantages that allow a company to continue to thrive. Next slide, please. My recommendations within this research is that human resources in every company at every capacity should look into providing help to parents. Such help includes daycare for their children, um, also paid leave for any emergencies that parents might have, also quality health care for parents and their dependents, and also flexible work schedule. Within the flexible work schedule, I will say that we can incorporate having parents stay at home and also be able to come to the office when it is suitable for their family to allow the parent to go to work. Um, I know a lot of companies are already doing this. I know Nestle Waters in Raynham, Massachusetts, is already doing this for parents, and it is going great. I have a lot of friends that do work at Nestle Waters, and that is where I used to work as well. And they have nothing but great things to say. They are thrilled to be in an environment where their personal life is also taken into account. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, so much. Um, and what a timely topic. Um, obviously, there's always been working parents, but you know, at, at this time when we, we, mo many of us have spent the last year <laughs> working from home and having this uh, crossover between work and home um, and all of us, you know, realizing, gee, we're, we're not just a worker, you know, everybody's a multiple, multiple things at all times. So um, really timely topic. Thank you so much, Maggie. And we will take some questions for you uh, later once our other presenters are done. Okay, so um, we are moving on now to PJ Lenza. So uh, PJ has a PowerPoint. He will be uh, talking us through it live. So whenever you are ready, PJ, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to my presentation today. As Denise mentioned, I'll be taking you on a journey through America's extremely polarized two-party political system. Next slide, please. So what really is polarization? Polarization, when used in a societal context, 
refers to two contrasting divisions amongst groups or societies. An example of polarization within American society would be amongst the two major political groups and ideologies. This polarization has formed in several ways. Polarization can stem from several dis different aspects of the polarizing factor. In the United States, there is extreme polarization within the political climate, culture, and even systems of politics. One aspect of American politics that has greatly contributed to polar polarization throughout history is in fact the two-party system, which inherently conjures up a political climate where politics is viewed as a partisan battle in which one side is victorious, opposed to a bipartisan game of integrated solutions. After more than two centuries of such a polarized climate, any American political issue has the ability to spark partisan debate, even amongst family members at Thanksgiving. However, it is important to look at some evidence of how exactly the two-party system has perpetuated this battle-like political culture in the United States today. Next slide, please. So according to this graph displayed on the slide from the Pew Research Center, regardless of party, presidents have typically held approval ratings of roughly 30 to 40% from the opposing party, as shown at the bottom of the graph and then 70 to 80% of their own party as shown at the top of the graph from the years 1953 to 1990. However, since 1990, Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama have all received at least an 80% approval rate from their own party, but a sub 30% approval rate from the other party. While this data was taken from years prior to Trump's presidency, I can only imagine that this gap continues to widen. These stats show that while party loyalty remains high and may be growing slightly, there is a clear increasing dislike of the opposing party's president. This could help to explain some of the increased political polarization because citizens are identifying with one group as strongly as ever, but also losing support for the other party and its candidates rapidly, creating an extremely polarized political climate. Next slide, please. So another example of how beliefs have been widening in recent history between the two major parties is the core values each party holds. According to the Pew Research Center display that's on the back of this slide, the percentage point difference on value-based questions taken from Democrats and Republicans has shown a steady increase in value differences among each party's constituents, meaning the two parties are more extreme in their views than ever. Without ever bridging this gap in some way, it appears the difference is amongst party values may continue to widen toward the most extremes. Next slide, please. Another reason for such polarization and partisanship within the political mainstream is in seemingly new sociological satisficing in which centrists no longer abstain from voting, but decide to vote for the lesser of two evils, causing centrist opinions to be overlooked by the two major parties. In this model displayed on the slide created by Vicki Yang, who is a complexity postdoctoral fellow at Santa Fe Institute and also created by her team from Northwestern. It provides a prediction of how the two parties will react given the likelihood of satisficing, ultimately causing the shift by both parties away from the center and towards extremist ideology. Now that centrists are satisficing, the parties do not share a need to turn, turn toward the center to receive more votes and are free to become more and more extreme in their views until the voters refrain from elections. Looking at the key on the top of the model here, you can see how the model shows this phenomenon. It's the predicted movement of each, um, the predicted movement of each party, actual movement of each party, and deviation of each party all continue moving away from the center as centrists continue to satisfy. Therefore, it is the job of voters, specifically centrist ones, to force the parties back toward the center and away from extremist values by abstaining to vote. In this specific model and situation, a relevant third party would be incredibly useful because it would inevitably force the two major parties toward the center in an attempt to reconsolidate powder, power. Uh, next slide, please. Clearly, according to this graph, the nation seems to agree that a third party has the potential to settle some of our political differences, with the studies from the Pew and Gallup research centers finding third party support has increased and consistently increased since about 1998, with just over 60% of 2018 eligible voters desiring a third party. As shown, this is the highest consistent percentage of third party support amongst voters since the 90s. For four straight years from 2014 to 2018, 
the percentage has remained just above 60, just at just about 60%, according to Gallup's data. If Yang's model is to be believed, the political turmoil experienced and lack of centrist representation in politics is greatly contributing to high third party support, a direct result of feeling misrepresented by the two major parties. Next slide, please. The chart shown here represents where there is the most desire for a third party. Using issues of immigration and economic dimension, which can essentially represent the views of the two different parties on the majority of major issues, there seems to be more support for a better centrist representation in politics. However, there is also some support for more extremist positions on both the left and the right. It is difficult to predict, but it can be expected that the emergence and legitimization of a third party, a strong centrist party, would push the two existing parties toward more extreme views, filling all desired areas shown in the chart and better representing the population as a whole. Proper representation within politics is essential when dealing with the political turmoil that has resulted from underrepresentation and misrepresentation. Next slide, please. Yang's model shows the main failure of the two-party system to be the lack of representation for centrist viewpoints, as well as the existence of more extremist voters from both sides of the aisle becoming disenfranchised. However, as a result of this lack of proper, proper representation, there has been major examples of political and social turmoil throughout the United States in recent years. Next slide, please. Many of these movements are polarized by a clashing two-party system. These images exhibit what, a, what path a country heads down when its politics are extremely polarized, but also lack the proper representation. Here you can see the so social turmoil sweeping the nation on all sides, with the burning of a Minneapolis police precinct during the Floyd protests on the top left, the storming of the Capitol building on the top right, and on the bottom right, an Antifa protest. Specifically, I'd like to pay attention to the image on the bottom left, which depicts a group that stated they did not belong to a single party, but were simply looking for candidates to support who were willing to take on the greed of big pharma and healthcare. A truly centrist group who feels neither party is truly or actively representing them. All of these images that show the social, social turmoil experienced in the USA are representative of only some of the social groups who, who feel misrepresented, I'm sorry, misrepresented by the party. Next slide, please. Finally, this image shows a March for Our Lives protest, with many students marching for action to be taken on gun violence. This is a great cause, but instead of focusing on studies that show certain background checks and vetting laws can be extremely useful, while restricting access to certain guns may not be as useful, politicians ignore these studies and polarize the nation over arbitrary aspects of the argument. Next slide, please. Having mentioned the support for third parties and alluded to their potential help to men partisan pol American politics, it would be remiss of me to ignore the concerns with antipical flaws of a multi-party democracy. One concern critics have with the system is a potential waste of resources, shown in the real world example of Nigeria, which witnessed multi-party democracy lead to a massive waste of resources. However, there is also extreme corruption in party politics within Nigeria that have allowed incumbents to direct public resources to their own campaigns. It could be argued then that a multi-party democracy does not on its own waste much larger, larger number of resources than a one or two party system may, as long as the system is well legitimized. Another common critique of a multi-party democracy is that it is assumed to be slow in response times and in legislating. This belief is a result of the theory that being forced to listen to and agree upon multiple different ideas is difficult. However, New Zealand offers a prime example of how a multi-party democracy can strive in this area with the right systems and dialogue in place. Finally, it is worth noting that many critics believe multi-party democracy fosters an unhealthy rivalry between parties. Quite simply, I would counter this critique by arguing that today there is an extremely unhealthy rivalry amongst the two parties in America that is more likely going to be helped by another party bridging the partisan divide than would be by then it would be deterred by that third party the democratic and republic parties continuously show a lack of effectiveness in their inability to compromise and the diversity of america cannot simply be re represented in two overarching parties at the same time 
Congress continues to remain gridlocked along partisan lines, while countries like New Zealand have been able to take swift action on national issues and even crises through their multi-party system. Next slide, please. New Zealand offers a perfect example of the benefits of a strong and thriving multi-party democracy, despite a minor decline in voter satisfaction in recent years, despite a concern for effectiveness within multi-party systems. New Zealand was ranked first in the world for effective COVID-19 response, with the US finishing just 10th on the same Bloomberg media survey of business, global business leaders. The nation responded so effectively that for months on end, they had no need for restricting social norms other than urging safe practices just in case, because they had essentially er eradicated the virus from the country. Another good example is gun control. And without getting into a debate over the way to handle it in America, a decades long debate in the US has paled in comparison to the swift action taken by New Zealand to stop and prevent shootings from taking place. Meanwhile, the United States still yells and bickers over which side does not care about children or which side wants to steal all their guns. Finally, an extremely important test of a nation's political party system's success within a democracy is their proper representation of the entire nation. This importance is great in the United States, the most diverse nation in the world. New Zealand has a great history with minority representation, having been the first nation to extend the right to vote to all women in 1893, expanding parliamentary representation to its indigenous Maori population in 1867, and further representing the same indigenous population in the 90s. On the other hand, the United States led nine different wars that relocated Native Americans, while countless more caused great bloodshed and casualty for Native American tribes, and was one of the last countries to abolish slavery. As shown to the right, New Zealand ranked fourth amongst the world's democracies for democratic strength in 2020, compared to the US ranking of just 23rd, proving that it is not just I who finds New Zealand to be a thriving multi-party democracy, but also the massive analytical department working for the economist the Economist Intel Intelligence Unit. Notably, the only other nation ranking in the top 25 strongest democracies without any strong third parties inside this index is Australia, Australia, which ranks 13th. It is becoming overwhelmingly clearer through recent analysis that a multi-party system likely would not hinder, but in fact benefit the United States with the right governmental structures also put in place. The United States has long been thought to be the world's leader and example of democracy, but if this is true, democracy may eventually be doomed. It will be up to the American people to, si to decide if they will continue to be misrepresented by a two-party system that has seemingly failed or call for and act, and, and act real change. I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to my presentation, and here's to a stronger democratic future. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. Uh, wonderfully done. And uh, so rare these days to hear a, a calm, even keeled, uh, well-researched approach to politics. So um, refreshing to say the least. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, and our final and third presenter today is Monique Santos. And Monique will also be uh, narrating her slides this morning. So Monique, whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Monique and my topic is on the evolution of the English language in the American experience and I will be tracing the impact of multiculturalism in the civil rights movements. Throughout these following slides, I will focus on African American, feminist and the LGBTQ influences and movements further showing the idea that as social conditions change, language changes along with it. Next slide, please. African Americans transformed America by altering the English language with their experiences while living Black. For instance, while the 1950s was a time where the idea of desegregating schools were beginning, the desire for equality and often a separate, separate African American literature and community was starting to thrive as well. This desire for equality turned into motivation, further causing Black artists to write about their struggles and encounters with racism, further creating the Black arts movement, which happened to have started halfway through the civil rights movement. According to poets.org, the Black arts movement stands as the single most controversial movement in the history of African-American literature, possibly in American literature as a whole. And it changed American attitudes towards the meaning of literature in different ways. 
One of the main members of this Black arts movement is a man named Larry Neal. One of the works he edited is called Black Fire, Anthology of Afro-American Writing, which consists of poetry, fictional stories, plays, essays, etc., all in which empower Black voices and reveals a Black experience in America. Next slide. Another important figure who has provided influence towards the English language is Bell Hooks. This woman is an American scholar who has looked into the topics of race, gender, and class. Her works have even consisted of being in the perception of Black women along with feminists. As English is the most common and dominant language in America throughout time in our history, others apart of America have altered it, African Americans being one of them. According to Bell Hooks, enslaved Black people took broken bits of English and made them a counter language. They put together their words in such a way that the colonizer had to rethink the meaning of the English language. This change has become more and more common in the American English language, whereas now white Americans are more understanding of Black vernacular. Examples of when African Americans have introduced new terms and phrases into the American English language include, but is not limited to goober, also known as peanut, crew, also known as gang, and many more. African Americans have also reclaimed derogatory racial slurs that have been used against them throughout American history, such as the N-word in songs, conversations, books, and more. Depending on circumstances, using this word while acting out in violence is considered a hate crime, which was not always the case throughout American history. Next slide, please. The differences African Americans have brought into American culture and the English language has to this day given others motive towards its, their discrimination, labeling those who speak different as uneducated and to speak in broken English. Examples of Black English is its grammatical features and differences, such as saying something along the lines of he be walking. However, as we become more accepting of differences in American culture and society, Language was included in that acceptance as the existence of Black English has become noticed and convinced people that it does in fact exist and it is valid. Additionally, Black English has left a mark on our pop culture with art, music, poetry, social media, and more, with artists such as Biggie Small, Snoop Dogg, and many others. Overall, this way of speaking is innovative and influential to the devel development of standard American English. Some terms that are commonly used and are caused by the African-American influence are you're the man, brother, and more, which all extend from the period of slavery to civil rights, from the jazz age to hip hop, the poetry of the people. Next slide, please. Next is the influence that feminism has brought onto the American English language. One person who has been viewed as a feminist is Emily Dickinson. She was one of the many female writers that addressed female equality in their work long before the word feminism was either coined or popular. Her words and writing have inspired many and she has been considered a part of the feminist movement due to her symbolic experience of not being able to display her talent. Throughout history, feminism has come in waves. The first wave being women fighting to vote, then fighting against discrimination, mostly in the workplace, but in society as well. And then the third wave was where race and class became an important factor, a part of the movement that mostly consisted, consisted of white women. This also eventually led women to start demanding respect when it came to sexist terms and phrases commonly used in the American English language created by the patriarchy. In America, our culture and more specific specifically our English language, tends to be dominated by men. In fact, according to Ann Pauls, a linguistic, men signal their authority in language through their roles in the dictionary making process to say the least. Next slide, please. One feminist who has embraced her own labeling in terms of herself is Audre Lorde. This woman was an African-American writer who wrote and exposed racism, sexism, homophobia, and more. She was known for embracing being black, lesbian, a feminist, a poet, a mother, and a warrior. Writings, writings from women such as Audre Lorde focused on issues of differences and voice have made important theatrical interventions calling for a recognition of the primacy of voices that are often silenced, censored, or marginalized. An example of that is shown with one of her works called A Woman Speaks. In a way, Audre Lorde and many other women demanded for change in many aspects, one of them including the American English language, demanding respect and change towards sexist pronouns and the way we communicate with each other in a male-dominated society. An example of how our language is gendered is how we have a tendency to use the expressions mankind and man-made to speak for all genders. Another example is within our occupations where we, which we have a tendency to refer to fire man and rarely fire woman. In some professions, we have resorted to changing the expressions used, such as instead of policeman or police woman, we use police officer. Next slide, please. 
Today, women continually face barriers to their equal participation in society, such as a language which may shape gender norms in a way that limits women's opportunities. For example, those who speak a gender language are more likely to agree with statements like, on the whole, men make better business executives than women do, or when jobs are scarce, men should have more of a right to a job than a woman. Overall, the way we speak, the words and phrases we use influences how we view others in the world around us, which does not just impact females and feminists, but also the LGBTQ plus community. Next slide, please. Similar to feminists, those are part of the LGBTQ plus community demanded and continually demand respect when it comes to their proper names, proper pronouns, and overall self-worth, further change in the English language. Within this community, there are many iconic figures to look up upon that has challenged the traditional American culture, including the English language. Marsha P. Johnson is one of these figures. She was a trans woman who was one of the many members associated with the 1969 Stonewall riots in New York City. Masha is an icon in the LGBTQ community due to her influence to fight for basic human rights. She was also one of the many trans women who legally changed her name from Malcolm Michaels Jr. to Masha P. Johnson, the P standing for pay it no mind, which was a response to those questioning her gender and correct pronouns. The effects LGBTQ people have with the American English language can alter and increase acceptance of LGBTQ plus groups in American society, such as how Marsha did when she transformed into her true self. Although it didn't happen quickly and not necessarily during her time period, it was a key point in changing America into a more accepting place over time. Next slide, please. Not only is society dominated by men, but it's dominated by straight men who have throughout time belittled and degraded those a part of the LGBTQ community. The heterosexual bias in American English language does not help the community in their acceptance in American culture. For example, the term homosexuality has been associated with in the past with deviance, mental illness, and criminal behavior. And these negative stereotypes may be perpetrated by biased language. Another example is that sexual orientation is also known as sexual preference, but the word preference su suggests a degree of voluntary choice. However, like heterosexuality, neither is much of a choice. An important LGBTQ member that in a way has challenged the American English language is Aunt Gloria Anzaldúa, who has analyzed and wrote about cultural identity from a point of view of a queer Chicana feminist activist writer. One of her works, Borderlands La Ferenza, has talked about her experience of being queer within her homophobic cultures, making those who have felt alone about their identities feel seen and valued. Next slide, please. One of the main ways the LGBTQ community has shaped our language is with the use of pronouns. Pronouns are a part of linguistics and how we refer to people. They are connected to gender expression. When we as a society start to introduce ourselves with our own pronouns, we create an environment where people can feel safe, seen, and appreciated. Especially since you are not always able to know someone's pronouns by just looking at them, using pronouns in your everyday language can lessen the mistake of disrespecting and or invalidating someone. English is not the only gendered language and there are many romance languages that have feminist, feminine and masculine aspects. However, mainly those are part of the LGBT community that speak these languages are trying to change that as well. For example, with the use of Latinx for those who don't identify as female or male. Next slide, please. Overall, to go back to the question on how multiculturalism in the civil rights movement has impacted the evolution of the English language in America, is throughout time as traditions, ideals, inventions, and people change, language follows along with it. The multiculturalism such as the African-American community, feminists, and LGBTQ members in America have experienced different kinds of oppression, further causing them to eventually challenge the traditional roots in American society. One of the ways they did this was by modifying the English language, leaving the notion that as social conditions have changed through generation after generation, a language has transformed into what it is today. Next slide, please. And these are my works cited. Monique, thank you so much. Super interesting look at uh, how language changes and its, and its integration with these different groups. Really super interesting. Thank you. So um, I want to say thank you to all three of our presenters today. How about a round of applause for all of them? Well done, everybody. Congratulations. And we do have about 20 minutes now um, for those of you who would like to uh, make uh, 
ask some questions aloud. There's a lot going on in the chat, but I'd like to invite you to um, speak up, ask your questions and uh, make any comments. Please go ahead. We have a lot of good time to keep uh, talking to one another. Looks like Bob Rack, you have a hand up. Please go ahead. I had a question. Uh, oh, I had a question for PJ. If uh, with the another multi-party system, I know there's always been question that well, if you put one another party, it's going to just draw people from one other party, and then no one gets a majority of the of the vote and stuff. So, do you have any idea how how long it would? I don't know if any research how long it would take for a third party to actually come in and uh, become prominent enough so that it it serves a, a, a like the purpose of having a multi-party system i guess it would be tough for me to i guess estimate estimate like length but um i i personally think that we'd be best off seeing like and sort of first adopting a sort of like mmp system or something where the mixed member proportional representation system so that because like you said, if we see um, no parties getting a majority and you need a majority to control your seat and what have you, then we'll then basically a big issue arises of kind of, I mean, you could go about it in the sense of, I forget exactly the terminology for it, but I think they had it on the mass ballot where the least candidates get knocked off and then you keep going up yeah, and up. Yeah. So you could utilize that, but I think um, the best is a coalition government because that's, I think that's the strongest multi-party system that we could see. So in terms of length, uh, I think it's really just, it, it would be a very long time only because I think we have to change American political culture to adopt the system first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, Thank thanks. you for your question. And uh, Robert has a hand up. Hi, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks to our great leaders here too, Lisa and Denise. I, I'm grateful. Um, I have a lot to say about everything, so I'll just, I won't say a lot, but uh, Maggie, on, on your presentation, and then PJ, I'll come back to you, but, uh, and Monique, but I'll, I'll maybe reserve a comment. <laughs> I, I'd like to interject a radical notion because I've written on soft skills and I don't think we should be calling them soft skills. I think we need a whole change of how we see these skills. And I, I call them the hard skills today. And on LinkedIn, I published an article I wrote on, on these skills and literally uh, you know, 50,000 people have clicked on that one short article that I wrote. Oh. and the, you know, we're, we're forgetting that I think the technology, even that we're, what we're doing now is kind of removing us from face-to-face -face interaction. And I think it's important when we have COVID-19, I, I don't question that. And I'm so grateful to BCC for guarding us from this terrible thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, Maggie, I, I just want you to maybe start talking about them as the hard skills um, and I've had CEOs and people I work with privately tell me that they can teach someone accounting, they can teach them the business aspects of business, but they're not able to teach them the skills that you do so well, and many people sitting here do so well. And that is the communicative skills that are required to be successful. Um, I call it the grunt and groan syndrome. I have so many people in my world that seem to grunt and groan their way through life. And, and no one makes any more eye contact. Two years ago on my birthday, on April the 5th, I had 30 friends surprise me and they all took their phones out and they all ended up playing with their phones instead of actually communicating. And we forget, you know, that I, I love poetry and I love Emily Dickinson. She's one of my favorites. I'm in love with Emily. But I also, I also love Emerson. And he said something, and I put this on all my syllabi, speech is power, speech is to persuade, to convert, to compel that we forget that this power in just, in just hearing someone's voice, if for, and I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but I was interacting with Jen P, um, you know, we were at a, a, a meeting together and just to hear Jen's voice was a voice of civility and kindness. And it reminded me of how I ought to be as well. But if we don't have that kind of interaction, 
then we're missing something. But anyhow, I don't mean to go on and on, but I, I'm so alarmed that we're calling these soft skills and I'm telling everyone I work with privately and I've worked with over 16,000 people on speech that we can no longer call them. I have women and men leading businesses telling me they're changing it now. These are the hard skills. Let's, can they actually speak? Can they get up in front of an audience and can they stand and deliver? Because their jobs and, and careers depend on it. But thank you very much, Maggie, because I thank can say you. so much more. I'm so thank I'm you so, so much, Rob. I really, really appreciate um, your feedback, and I completely 100% agree with you. Um, everything I've researched came up with soft skills, and I do agree with you, even when I was researching it, and only because I have worked um, for over 10 years, and I believe that these skills are super important. Um, a lot of people don't have them, and it's alarming, and there's I feel like they're, they're even more important than those skills that we consider hard skills. I remember a few years back in um, 2017, I took English 101 and I was alarmed when I first came into VCC because there were students who were on their phones. And I remember the professor speaking and they wouldn't even look up. They were just yes. on their phones and they were all so young. Um, and not to say that all young students do this because they don't, but the majority in that room were all young folks. And I did notice that and I was like, oh my God, this is heartbreaking because I felt like they haven't been taught yet that you need to look at a professor, communication, eye contact, these are all super important. And I did notice that we were, we were missing um, that piece. And so I'm very, very grateful that you brought that up. I did see some of the comments on the chat and um, I do, I did not, you know, go ahead and tap into the emotional intelligence, but I am grateful that you brought that up because it would be something that I will be researching. I do love HR and that is my dream job and I, I cannot wait, career cannot wait. And so I will take every feedback into consideration and I will be joining you on the bandwagon and it will be called high skills um, yeah. from this point on. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and then uh, Maggie, uh, Jen, uh, Jen just put a, a great book up there too from the Northeastern's. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, I, I mean, it. I, I have so much on this topic, but I agree with you, Maggie, and I'm, I, I feel like we're intellectual soulmates. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And if you'd like to put your BCC address in the chat, Perhaps you and Maggie can uh, continue the conversation, or if you prefer to share it with me, Robert, and then I can pass it on to her. Feel sure. free. I put, I put my address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great conversation. Uh, over these last few days, um, during this part of the presentation, it's been really wonderful. Like to, to just have these a group of people having an awesome conversation on these topics. So thank you so much. Um, okay. Other questions or comments for our presenters. Bob Rack. Uh, yeah, yeah, question box here. The, uh, uh, for, this is uh, for Monique. And uh, I thought it was very important that you showed that thing about where you had uh, like homosexuality and it's, it's not a preference. You know, because I think so many people think that, well, you know, and, and you saw a thing even with the vice president, how he had the things where he could uh, change people afterwards and you could turn them back. And, you know, it's it's even shown that in, in nature, uh, homosexuality is shown in 500 species. So it's not that it's something that people are saying, oh, this is an unnatural thing and it's just a preference and stuff like that. So it's... Uh, I think that was a, a key point uh, that you had there uh, about that. And uh, another thing also, uh, uh, have you seen with the, the use of the N-word where there actually is some movement to try and remove that even from the, because it's so confusing as far as with the youth coming up who have grown up with hip hop and then use that language if if you're not in the black community and then it gets uh, you know very confusing there for people i've seen i when i'm researching i 
was reminding about the censorship, like with education, with books that use that word a lot, like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example. Some schools have banned the use of that book due to that word being in it as much. It's an interesting conversation about language and how powerful words are and how um, they change, you know, that they're, they're alive, words are alive and what we assign to them is is what um, keeps them that way. So, uh, you know, we've got a long way to go in that conversation, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Rack. And uh, Kelly, go ahead. Thanks. Um, my, my comments for Maggie, um, I appreciated your presentation. I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of us who, who teach or have taught have, you know, know how to appreciate the, um, you know, the maturity and the, and the skills that a lot of our parents, students bring. It's hard, it's hard to know how to talk about that in a job interview situation. I find that like, I, I kind of think about that because I, I, I have a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old myself, and it's, it's been, <laughs> I've gotten a lot more appreciation for what it takes to be a, a working parent, I think, even the past few years. Um, but also, too, like, if that were the kind of thing that I were going to try to, like, bring up as, a, as an advantage to me in a, you know, in an interview situation, it's tough to know how to do that because, you know, legally speaking, there are a lot of good reasons why people can't ask me whether I'm a parent. But at the same time, like, you know, with that sort of culture around a, a sort of, you know, like, you can't talk about being a parent makes, you know, I wonder how Patagonia did that. Like, how do they create a culture where, like, you know, it's, it's totally like in that, in that environment, they want to know if, about, you know, what you're bringing to the table. That's really interesting. And, and it's, I feel like that's part of a wider conversation of like, if these are some good skills, how do we talk about them in a way that like, you know, keeps people legally protected, but also doesn't disadvantage them by saying, well, we can't talk about this because it's illegal to ask. I'm glad you brought that point up. And I did not research as to how Patagonia goes about it. So I'm glad you brought that up because it will be something that I will be further researching on how they start with that approach. Um, I do think that the resume is probably a good area. I remember when I first started at Nestle Waters, I, at first, within the first month, I dreaded putting pictures of my children up because of the stigma. Oh my God, she has children. Oh my God, she might not be able to be the leader that we might want her to be. Um, and so I was afraid. And then I slowly started putting pictures up of my children. And then it was pretty interesting because workers are coming by and seeing my cubicle and saying, oh my God, Maggie, these are beautiful children. Um, and so I was like, wow, well, yes, these are my children. And that conversation started and it was very natural. And I remember everyone was so blown away within my first month, my performance um, was, was really, really good. And they could not figure out, okay, how can you, do so well at work and also balance that um, the children at home, that, that personal life. And so I, that conversation started happening with my coworkers and it started spreading. Um, and so people were very, very interested in that. But I do agree, there is a lot of stigma behind um, parents um, working in the workplace. And so I just encourage all parents to kind of find a way to throw themselves out there um, because you never know, we do have these amazing hard skills and we need to be able to embrace them and talk about them. And, you know, as a future HR worker, I do want to make sure that I find a way where this is more acceptable to speak about um, and people are not ashamed to talk about it at, at work. It, it's okay, you're a parent and you can also be a rock star at work as well. Thank you, great point. And um, Gary, who is our HR representative here at Bristol Maggie, I'm not sure if you knew that, but go ahead, Gary. I did. <laughs> Well, first of all, it's really good to be with all of you today, and I'm glad I, I was able to hear everybody's great. Pre I love the presentations, and I love being a part of this group, so thank you for allowing me to do that. I just want to put that on the table, and and uh, Rob and Bob, your input has been great in terms of HR. Um, Maggie, you'll do fine. You'll do great. You have, you know, you certainly are a very welcoming person, and I think that's the biggest part of what HR is all about, 
and bringing allowing people to have their feelings in the workplace is very, very important. And you certainly seem to suggest that that's what you would allow. That's what I allow. I always tell people when they come to HR, you have every right to your feelings. You have every right to your opinions and to your needs and to your emotions, and they should never be, um, you know, put ejected or put into a box. That's not really good HR. Not going to lie to you, that's not probably what you're going to find from HR people out in the real world. Unfortunately, um, that kind of speak is probably not as prevalent as we would like it to be from an HR perspective. I always kind of consider myself an outlier and, you know, good or bad, um, you know, it's just something you might want to be aware of what's out there when you get in the I just don't want you to, to think it's all like, you know, you're, it seems like what you have and what I have for perspectives might not be what HR is out there. So I do want to put that on the table. The second thing I, I wanted to ask you about was um, one of the things that I always think about is emotional intelligence, right? What you bring to the table in terms of emotional intelligence, because we can train people. We, we can we we can hire people who have really good emotional intelligence, who have um, you know high speak and all of that, and 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 their competencies they bring to the table. But we can train to what they need. But it's really the culture fit, the cultural understanding, the equity understanding and the emotional intelligence that is sometimes the harder thing to bring to the table. And that's what we really need now in our workforce. What are your thoughts on that, if you don't mind me asking? Absolutely, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, to your first point before I answer this question, um, I do think that it all starts with HR on you know, making, um, making sure that they build a connection with their employees to make sure that employees feel comfortable enough to even share um, the fact that they do have children, that they are parents, because that is such a huge part of everyone's lives. And so it all starts with leaders. Mm -hmm. Leaders need to make sure that they set the, the, the scenario or the mm -hmm stage for um, workers to feel comfortable um, stating that they are parents. So I think it just, it all starts with the top tier, um, the leaders, HR. Um, now to your second point, em emotional intelligence. I do agree with you. I, I, I feel like em emotional intelligence is extremely important. Um, I think that emotional intelligence starts off with parents at home. Um, I was lucky enough where my mom was always, you know, speak your feelings, let me hear them out. And I'm always constantly talking to my children about the emotional intelligence, just making sure that they can tap in into all their emotions and be able to speak about them freely. And I think that that is what allows um, the, these uh, candidates that are looking for work to be able to be successful and thrive in a working environment is because we have been trained um, to, to be able to tap into that emotional intelligence that we all have, but sometimes we just don't know how to express and let out that emotional intelligence that we all have, but we sometimes we're just not capable of doing that. So the question can be looked at as if workers or employers are not able to tap into that emotional intelligence, what can HR do to be able to promote and help and, and train um, individuals to be able to tap into that emotional intelligence that is so important to be able to thrive in a working um, environment? Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you for allowing me to ask that question, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you, Gary. We're coming up at one o'clock, but um, Bob Rock, if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to mention about the, you know, I really like the concept of uh, the hard skills rather than, uh, you know, calling them soft skills, because I was a uh, manager in a past life. <laughs> I was a uh, laboratory director for a number of years, and those skills are, are, are so important. And uh, just, just the ability to listen you know, is something because if you can't listen, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, if you're not listening to the person trying to train you and uh, what is it and just, and just knowing how to communicate with one, you know, I, I've, I've only had to fire, I only had to fire two people and, and it's, it's very difficult as a manager for me, you know, to fire, to fire someone, but, you know, you find out that people fire themselves because they don't know, have the, the proper skills to communicate and, and stuff and, and, and just ask questions when they should have asked questions and things. So I, I think it's, it's very important that these skills be looked on as a, a much higher level than, uh, 
what what they've looked at in the past because you know you you can't train someone if they don't have the the hard skills thank you well we are just about out of time ladies and gentlemen thank you so much um i want to thank of course our presenters today maggie pj and monique uh wonderful information so well done thank you all i want to thank lisa noel who um is the person behind the curtain thank you lisa for uh helping me organize this <laughs> and to all of you in the audience, uh, such a rich conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and, and uh, interact with our graduating honors students. Um, honors program cannot run without support from faculty, especially who agree to work with students as their mentors in these final projects. And uh, I think it's one of the highlights of, of our program here uh, is that relationship that um, a student can have with their faculty member. It's an opportunity that a lot of times students don't get until much, much later in their academic careers. Um, so thank you all. And um, we have one more day tomorrow, our fourth of four days. And thank you for dropping in today. And if you can show us show up tomorrow, that'd be great too. Um, meanwhile, I wanna wish you all a good afternoon. Um, I'll ask the presenters to stick around for another minute um, and wish you all well. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye.